Thanks, Jim. Um, he didn't quite give my entire bio background, but uh, the majority of my research focus has been on manure management for the last 10 years. So you're probably wondering why someone uh, with a manure management background is here to talk about grain storage, and honestly, so am I a little bit. But I was sitting at the table and I was realizing, I've been doing manure management stuff for 10 or 12 years. I've never been invited to be a keynote speaker anywhere. I've been doing grain storage stuff for three or four and here I am. So obviously there's a lot more interest in grain storage research and um, maybe I should be shifting my focus a little bit. I, I do not pretend to know it all. I have been only been doing this for three or four years. I did grow up on a grain farm, so I, I'm aware of the, the pitfalls and the triumphs of grain storage. But um, I don't pretend to know it all. I know the majority of you probably know more about it than I do. You definitely have more hands-on experience than I do in grain storage. But I will be talking about the research project we've been working on for three years, and I was able to tap into the expertise available at PAMI. PAMI's been doing grain storage and natural air drying research since 1988. So I talked to a lot of the folks there about uh, their findings, and I was also able to talk to the Ministry of Saskatchewan Agriculture people that have been answering grain storage questions at the Ag Knowledge Centre for 20 years. So hopefully I've been able to bring all that information together and give you some information today that may be new to you. Okay, quick overview of where my talk's going to take you. I am first going to outline the differences between aeration and natural air drying and hot air drying. I'll talk about safe storage times of canola as well as um, how storage of canola and high oil content canola differs from other grains and regular canola. Then I'll talk about natural air drying and controlling natural air drying using the concept of equilibrium moisture content, which is what the automatic control strategy we developed at PAMI is dependent upon. I'll talk about some potential benefits and savings and other control strategies. When you do a Google image search of grain storage, you get a variety of images, ranging from rustic to temporary to typical farm scale to large scale to advanced. The information I'm going to give you today is uh, basically only applicable for farm scale storage in steel bins, uh, both hopper bottom and flat bottom for a capacity range between 2,000 and 5,000 bushels. So what's the issue? Well, grain spoils. And when grain spoils, you get massive revenue losses of tens of thousands of dollars, depending on the size of your bin. Hot or wet grain, is, it t tends to spoil faster than other grains, just because the insects, fungal molds, and mites thrive in hot and moist conditions. The temperature window for insect growth is actually fairly narrow. It's between 15 and 40 degrees Celsius. But grain that comes off the field dry, if it is, um, or actually grain that comes off uh, in a lower temperature range or in the safe temperature range, if it's moist, the microbial activity within that grain, because it's moist, will actually raise its temperature just based on the biological activity. So you have to manage both moisture content and temperature to prevent spoilage. You can obviously dry grain by blowing air through it. Um, and hot air does dry grain faster than cold air, just because the larger the temper temperature difference, the greater the vapor pressure difference, and the faster the transfer of moisture from grain to the air. <clears throat> Warmer air also has a greater ability to hold moisture than cold air. Um, a quick rule of thumb I always remember is one cubic meter of air at 30 degrees Celsius will hold 30 grams of water. That same volume of air at 20 degrees Celsius only holds 20 grams of water, and at 10 degrees Celsius holds 10 grams of water. So the warmer the air, the more water it can actually hold. So basically, grain, con grain conditioning and storage requires careful management of both temperature and moisture content. So if you're going to be drying grain using a hot air system, you have to cool it afterwards in order to get down into the, below that temperature window where insects like to grow. And then monitor, monitor, monitor. So that seems simple enough. Keep grain cool and dry. It's not quite that easy, mainly because of temperature variation within a bin. And temperature variation issues become larger with larger bins. Temperature variations cause issues because different temperatures hold different amounts of moisture. So if you have a temperature variation, you also have a moisture variation. Temperature variations can be caused by ineffective air distribution systems or the lack of an air distribution system altogether. 
Temperature variations can also be caused by natural convection driven by the outside air temperature. Um, basically, this will result in high moisture zones at the top of the bin when the outside air is cool and high moisture zones at the bottom of the bin when the outside air is warm. And this is especially problematic with larger diameter bins because there's going to be a greater temperature difference between the grain at the side of the bin and the grain in the middle. These temperature variations can be minimized with aeration. Basically, you're providing a continuous or a semi-continuous airflow through the grain to uh, condition it and prevent any hot spots or variations of temperature and moisture. How long can you store canola before you have to get worried? Well, this, this chart is uh, a typical safe, safe storage time for canola, and I think it's, it appears in every single slide deck you're going to see today. So it's pretty common. I'm sure you've all seen it. This particular one came from the Ministry of Saskatchewan Agriculture and Food in their 1997 document, I believe. So basically, canola is, is dry at 10%. So if canola is dry, you can see based on the chart, as long as it's stored at less than 20 degrees Celsius, you have minimal chance of spoilage for up to five months. If it comes off slightly tough, around 11 or 12%, then you have to keep it below 10 degrees Celsius to prevent spoilage. Charts like this should be used with caution, however. They are just a guideline. Um, unless you're really, really vigilant about monitoring every single space within the bin, you can easily uh, have a hot, a hot pocket develop, and that will totally negate charts like this if you um, have situations like that. So basically, if uh, the grain comes off in a, in a wetter, like wetter than 11 or 12%, and hot, greater than 20 degrees, it requires conditioning in order to get down into the safe storage zone. Now, what is conditioning? Aeration and natural air drying, the terms are often used interchangeably, but there is a fundamental difference between the two. Aeration results in cooling or conditioning of the grain. To achieve this, you need airflow rates of about 0.1 to 0.2 CFM per bushel, or cubic feet per minute per bushel. And basically, if the ambient air is cooler than the grain, your grain is going to cool. Pretty simple. Uh, a, couple, a couple documents I found had this rule of thumb, where if your airflow rate is 0.1 CFM per bushel, it'll take about 8 to 10 days of fan operation to equalize the temperature within the bin. Now this depends on the temperature difference between outside and inside and your actual airflow rate, but it's a pretty common guideline for aeration times. <clears throat> Natural air drying, or near ambient drying, on the other hand, is actually using the air's natural ability to remove moisture to dry the grain down. You're not just cooling, you're actually reducing the moisture content. To achieve this, you need much higher airflow rates. You need airflow rates around 1 to 2 CFM per bushel. And in this case, if the air has capacity to dry, then the moisture content of your grain will go down. And I'll be talking about capacity to dry quite a bit more later on when I talk about natural air drying. Um, but basically, capacity to dry is if the moisture content of the air is less than the moisture content of the grain, then the grain will transfer moisture to the air and the grain will dry. And I'd love to give you a nice little rule of thumb as to how long it takes to achieve drying with natural air drying, but because natural air drying is so dependent on ambient conditions, the relative humidity and the temperature of the outside air, it's really not possible to give a, a really standard rule of thumb. Um, some information we gathered was uh, quite typically it took 7 to 14 days of, of continual fan operation to dry wheat from 16.5 to 14.5, but that was one set of ambient conditions. It's never going to be repeated exactly over and over again to give a nice guideline. But generally, you're talking 7 to 14 days just for 2% in wheat. For both aeration and natural air, dry, air drying systems, um, upward air movement is preferred over downward air movement. Both systems do exist. Um, but with upward air movement, it is a lot easier to monitor the progress of the cooling front or the drying front because you can take samples from the top of the bin. And also with upward air movement systems, you can start up the system before the bin is actually full. As soon as the distribution system is covered with grain, you can fire up the fan. However, with upward air movement systems, you do get condensation um, on the lid of the bin at the top, obviously, and uh, that can be problematic as well. Right now, the general recommendation is to turn fans on and let them run continuously until your grain reaches the desired moisture content or temperature. And I'll talk about strategies to possibly optimize the on-off cycle of fans, depending on ambient conditions, a little bit later on. Okay, so I just 
contrasted the difference between natural air drying and aeration. Now I want to talk about the difference between natural air drying and heated air drying. Pretty basic. But as I said, the hotter the air, the faster it dries, because the hotter the air, the greater the vapor pressure difference between the kernel and the air. So hot air drying systems are pretty common. Uh, they use relatively high temperatures, and, and the temperature you actually use depends on the, the system you have and the grain you're, you're drying and the ultimate end use of the grain. For example, if canola is going to be used for seed, you don't want to be drying it in a hot air system, anything with temperatures higher than 45 degrees Celsius, because you can uh, damage its germination rate from that. So it's using higher temperatures, and it's also using much higher airflow rates. Typical hot air drying systems use airflow rates of 8 to 15 CFM per bushel. And because you're, you're drying smaller batches of grain at such high airflow rates, the retention time of the air or the contact between the air and the grain is really, really small. But because of the high vapor pressure difference, it dries rapidly. But that retention time means that there's not a lot of contact time between the, the, the kernels and that hot air. So it minimizes the chances of grain damage due to that, those hot temperatures. Natural air drying, as I said, relies on the air's natural capacity to remove moisture. Um, transfer of moisture from grain to air is really, really slow below 10 degrees Celsius, however. So natural air drying is not recommended below 10 degrees Celsius. You can add heat to the um, air in a natural air drying system, and that's simply just going to increase its capacity to dry. And that's a pretty common practice when you're trying to extend the natural air drying season or if the weather just isn't cooperating. Obviously, adding heat to a natural air drying system is going to result in added costs. Um, so the general recommendation is to not increase that air by more than 10 degrees Celsius. Uh, anything more than that, and the, the cost is going to go up quite a bit. And again, because natural air drying systems use a much lower airflow rate than hot air drying systems, your retention time is quite a bit higher in natural air drying systems. So you don't want to increase that temperature so much that it might damage the grain due to its higher retention time. But adding heat to natural air drying systems are an effective way to extend the natural air drying season or to use natural air drying when it's just it's rainy and cold during the, during the harvest season. Okay, quick contrast to the pros and cons of natural air drying compared to heated air drying. Uh, because you're not adding any heat, you're just blowing air through the system with natural air drying, there's quite a bit of energy savings. And obviously a smaller investment on the initial equipment. And you can also, because you're using lower temperatures, it'll result in a higher quality of grain. And this can be um, especially useful, I guess, when you're drying crops like malt barley that are susceptible to higher temperatures during drying. However, natural air drying is slow, especially when the ambient conditions aren't cooperating. It requires management. You have to be monitoring the temperature uh, and moisture content of your grain and quite most likely the, the ambient conditions as well. And it is highly dependent on ambient conditions and sometimes Mother Nature just does not cooperate. And there's really no good windows in the, heart, in the fall season to do any natural air drying. Okay, so as I've mentioned, the fundamental difference between aeration and natural air drying is airflow rate. And up until now, I've only been talking about CFM per bushel. If there's any metric-minded folks out there, here are the flow rates in liters per second per cubic meter. Okay, and this is where a lot of confusion comes into play because aeration is one to two liters per second per cubic meter, but natural air drying is one to two CFM per bushel. So you have to be careful to know which units you're talking about with your dealer when you're sizing your fan, your aeration requirements, that you're talking one or the other and you're not mixing the two units. CFM or bushel is just way easier to remember in my opinion, because it's 0.1 to 0.2, then multiply by 10, 1 to 2 for, for natural air drying. Okay, so airflow rate is important if you're wanting to um, I guess, manage the difference between aeration and natural air drying. Airflow rate from a specific fan depends on static pressure. And static pressure is affected by the resistance to airflow, or static pressure is basically equal to the resistance to airflow. And static pressure depends on three main things. Grain type, depth of grain, and the type of your air distribution system. I'm gonna talk about all these in a little bit more detail later on, but just really quickly, Grain type basically affects the, the size of the grain voids, and the grain voids is what the air is actually passing through. So the smaller the kernel, the smaller the grain voids, and the greater the resistance to airflow. 
The depth of grain, obviously, the greater the depth, the, the more resistance to airflow there is, so the higher the static pressure with, with greater grain depth. And the type of distribution system, uh, depending on the type, you, you'll get uh, a wide variety of surface, surface areas or perforations that the air can actually pass through, and that will also affect the uh, static pressure quite a bit. Okay, first I want to talk about a typical fan curve. Um, every fan should have a fan curve that will tell you its operating pressure I think I lost my sound. Oh no, there we go. Um, the operating pressures and the, the, the flow rates you're going to get with those pressures. And you only get one airflow rate with each pressure, basically, if you follow this curve. So let's say your, your fan has, has this fan curve, and it says that at five inches of water column static pressure, it gives you 2,000 CFM of airflow rate. Okay, pretty straightforward. Now for that same fan, if you increase the grain depth by say a foot or so, it'll increase your static pressure and if you follow it along to, the, to the, the, the fan curve, an increase in static pressure will reduce your airflow rate. And if you increase the static pressure even more, you're adding more and more grain to the bin, up beyond the top of that curve, your fan is gonna choke off and you are not gonna get any airflow rate whatsoever. The fan curve is also gonna depend on the fan size. So we could say that this is a fan curve for let's say a three horsepower fan. And if we put that three horsepower fan on, let's say a 2,000 bushel bin uh, with a certain air distribution system and a certain depth of grain, uh, it might operate at 2,000 two CFM for five inches of water column. For that same bin and that same system, if you put a five horsepower fan on there, it might need to only operate at three inches of water column to get the same airflow rate. So fan size obviously affects the operating static pressure as well. <clears throat> Systems that are designed to provide airflow rates for aeration probably cannot be very effectively used for natural air drying because the aeration flow rate is so much lower than natural air drying. So if your system is sized only for aeration and you want to use it for natural air drying, monitor the static pressure as you're filling and you're likely only, only going to be able to fill the bin half or three quarters of the way at the most. Okay, so remember, airflow rate depends on static pressure, and static pressure depends on grain type, grain depth, and the type of distribution system. So these charts illustrate how grain type affects static pressure. Not sure how visible these are, but these are also from the, uh, the Saskatchewan Extension document in, from 1997. On the left, we have operating static pressures for a coarse grain, like wheat, and on the right are the operating static pressures for canola or mustard. The vertical axis is static pressure, and the horizontal axis is depth. And then the three lines that are running up on each one of them just represent the different airflow rates. The bottom line is 0.5 CFM per bushel, and the middle one is, is one CFM per bushel. So if we look at uh, the operating pressure for a grain depth of 15 feet for wheat, which is a coarser grain, I don't know if you can see my dot over there, probably not. If you follow the, the line that for 15 feet depth up until the, you heat the middle line, the middle of the three, and run across, we're operating at five inches of water column for wheat to get one CFM per bushel. On the right, the exact same grain depth, 15 feet up to one CFM per bushel, operates at seven inches of water column, just because the smaller grain results in smaller grain voids and a higher resistance to airflow. Same chart can be used to illustrate how grain depth affects static pressure. And this one's pretty basic and straightforward. This one is for canola, so again, if you look at uh, a grain depth of 15 feet, run it up, it hits the middle line at seven inches of water column. Grain depth of only 10 feet operates at three inches of water column. So the greater the grain depth, the greater the static pressure, and the lower the airflow rate from a given fan. And the last one is the effect of air distribution system on static pressure. Uh, PAMI in the 80s and 90s tested several different distribution systems uh, that were designed for hopper bottom, bin, hopper bottom bins including Univision Ultralight, uh, the Kehoe Cyclone, Trailrite V-Aeration, Univision Inline, West Seal Boot. I think there was a total of 14 or 15 different systems that they tested. And they tested them all on the, on the exact same bin with the same grain type, same grain depth, and the same fan. And the difference in operating pressures, or sorry, the difference in the, in the static pressures to achieve one CFM per bushel ranged from two and a half to 8.2 inches of water column. All of the variables being held the same the different air distribution systems resulted in significantly different um, static pressures to achieve the exact same airflow rate. So it's all about perforations, it's all about the surface area available for the air to pass through.
Okay, last thing I want to talk about is, um, or in this section anyway, the last thing I'm going to cover is the effect of bin dimensions on fan requirements. I came across this, this really quick guideline in several different documents where, you know, it's at the size of the fan you need for different sizes of bins. So it says for a 2,000 bushel bin, you need about a 3 horsepower fan. This is for natural air drying. Uh, a 3,500 bushel bin needs about a 5 horsepower fan, and a 5,000 bushel bin needs a 7 to 10 horsepower fan. And that's fine. But remember that uh, airflow rate depends more on grain depth than grain volume. For example, let's take two bins. Both have the exact same volume. They both have capacities of 3,000 bushels. The bin on the left has a diameter of 22 feet. The bin on the right has a diameter of 18 feet. So obviously to get the same volume, you need a much greater depth for the bin on the right. So we have a 10 foot grain depth on the left and a 15 foot grain depth on the right. To achieve, in this case, I think it was 0.75 CFM per bushel for whatever reason, um, the bin on the right is going to have to operate at seven and a half inches of static pressure and the bin on the left was going to be 3.5. So to achieve that airflow rate, you would need a three horsepower fan for the 3,000 bushel bin on the left, but a five horsepower fan for the same capacity of bin uh, for the one on the right. So this just indicates that grain depth is a much better indicator of the size of the fan required than grain volume. And most um, sizing procedures do account for this. So I guess everyone's urged to make sure that you're, you're using those proper sizing procedures when you're sizing a system for a bin, rather than general guidelines that are based on volume only. Okay, uh, quick, I guess, recap is the fundamental difference between aeration and natural air drying is airflow rate. And airflow rate depends on static pressure, and static pressure depends on the distribution system, grain depth, and uh, grain type. Yes, there's a test on this later. <laughs> okay. Okay, so you get it. Static pressure is important because airflow rate is important, right? How do you measure static pressure? Well, luckily, static pressure is actually fairly easy to measure. Unlike airflow rate, uh, static pressure is, is pretty straightforward. You can buy manometers, and they're actually fairly cheap, or you can MacGyver one yourself if you want. You, you just need a flexible, transparent tube uh, with an inner diameter of at least a quarter inch, um, and you need a measuring device that measures up to 10 inches, and then a board to, to attach it all to. You basically attach one side of your manometer, like you, you attach it in a U shape. You attach one side to your transition duct, and the other end you leave open to the atmosphere, fill the bottom part with water, and when the fan is operating, the static pressure will be represented as uh, the difference in height in the two water levels. So it's pretty straightforward. So it's recommended to monitor static pressure as you're filling a bin, because if you know that that specific fan gives out 2,000 CFM at five inches of water column, Monitor the static pressure as you're filling and only fill until you get to five inches of water column. And then you know you're getting 2,000 CFM. And then you can figure out the volume that you have to get to that five inches and figure out exactly what your flow rate is. Other bin considerations I'll just touch on really briefly are bin fill and exhaust vents. Basically, grain is going to pile as you fill it just due to its angle of repose. And uh, I guess the grain pile at the, at the top of the bin can, can affect the temperature and the moisture distribution within the bin just because it affects the air distribution within the bin. Um, there's some research that shows, and I'm not sure how clear this is showing up, but there's some research that shows when you let, a, when you let the grain peak at the top of the bin, like in the middle of the yellow pictures, it can increase drying times with a natural air drying system by 50%. And if you fill the bin, like the yellow picture on the right, it can actually increase drying times by 80%. So it's recommended for, especially for larger diameter bins, to use a grain spreading device, and that'll help even out the peak at the top of the bin. And grain, grain spreading devices also have the added benefit of spreading out fines, which will prevent any pockets of denser material, which will then result in um, issues with the air distribution as well. And exhaust vents are, are pretty common for larger bins, and this just helps expel moist air from the top of the bin, which prevents condensation from forming at the top of the grain. How does storage of canola differ from storage of other grains? Well, canola, because of its oil content, is sensitive to spoilage. So the target moisture content for canola is, is quite a bit lower than, than other grains. The other issue with canola is that it respires for up to six weeks after harvest. Um, this means that the grain essentially isn't dormant, it's still living for up to six weeks after harvest, meaning it could come off perfectly dry and perfectly cool you put it in the bin and just the, the biological activity that's still going on in that canola can produce its own heat. So perfectly safe to store canola can come off, can off, 
come off the field and within two or three weeks you're in trouble just because it's still respiring. So aeration or conditioning of canola is always recommended whether or not it comes off dry uh, for at least the first six weeks after harvest. Also because of the smaller kernels um, or the smaller size of canola compared to other grains, it has a greater resistance to airflow and we already talked about that quite a bit. Um, so a system that's sized for natural air drying of wheat might not achieve the required airflow rates for natural air drying of canola if you just put canola in the exact same bin. So again, be careful, monitor the static pressure and maybe only fill the bin three quarters of the way full. Also because of canola's higher susceptibility to, to spoilage and its greater resistance to airflow, fully perforated floors are most commonly recommended for canola. And these just help give a nice even uh, air distribution, distribution for the large mass. Oil content can also degrade in adverse or high temperature storage conditions for canola. Um, PAMI did a, a relatively short two month study last year looking at the storage of canola at a variety of different temperatures. So canola was held at uh, temperatures from zero to 30 degrees Celsius for two months and we looked at the degree of spoilage um, and the degree of oil degradation. And actually it turned out that even for the samples that had visible spoilage on it, like mold growth on it, the oil degradation was still within tolerance limits uh, as, in, or as established by the industry. But that was only a two month storage period. Uh, anything longer than two months might result in significant oil degradation. And there's some longer term studies underway right now. How does storage of high oil content canola differ from regular canola? Well, again, it's the oils that are susceptible to degradation, so it makes sense that higher oil content canola will be more susceptible to degradation. However, in that PAMI, that two month PAMI study, they had a variety of different canolas, and they had regular canola and high oil content canola. And it turned out the high oil content canola behaved the same as the regular canola over those two months in terms of spoilage and in terms of having minimal oil degradation. But again, that was only a two month incubation period, so anything longer than that might result in um, more significant oil degradation. Generally, the uh, target moisture content for higher oil content canola is lower than for regular canola. It's about 8% versus 10% which means that these safe storage time charts that exist for canola might not be valid for high oil content canola. So there's some longer term storage studies currently underway and we hope to get uh, the results of those out to you as soon as possible so that you can more reliably store canola for longer terms. And then lastly, there was some question or some issue about potential compaction of higher oil content canola. Uh, if you have a really tall bin, it's possible that the weight of the canola pushing down on the canola at the bottom might result in compaction or oil extrusion. So PAMI ran a test where we simulated a variety of grain depths up to 100 feet, which is quite extensive, and there was absolutely no evidence of grain compaction or oil extrusion whatsoever. So compaction is probably not an issue with high oil content canola, or any kind of canola for that matter. Okay, so this is, this is, from here on out, is basically what my research for the last three years has been based on, and this was optimization of natural air drying. So natural air drying, again, uses the air's natural ability to dry grain. Systems are really common, I see them in every single farmyard I've, I've driven by, but they are not used to their full effectiveness, or they're not used very efficiently. The common practice or the, the standard of practice is to turn the fans on and let it run continuously until the grain at the top is dry. And because these systems draw air from the bottom to the top, by the time the grain at the top is dry, the grain at the bottom is over dry. And because these systems use the air's natural ability to dry, and the air's natural ability to dry varies from day to day and within each day, there's a lot of times where the fan is running and you're not achieving anything within the bin. <coughs> The air needs capacity to dry before it's actually going to do anything in the bin. And if farmers are trying to, I guess, reduce their, their power bill by turning the fans on and off when they think the air has capacity to dry, it's based on a lot of guesswork because there's no real reliable, cheap way to monitor in-grain moisture content during drying and there's really no way to determine if the air has capacity to dry. So PAMI's goal was to develop a control system that would automatically turn the fans on and off, depending on the air's capacity to dry and depending on the, the grain's condition. 
This would basically be a set it and forget it kind of system, so it would reduce labor inputs and uh, reduce guesswork. And it would hopefully prevent overdrawing of grain, which can be quite costly, as I'll discuss later. And it would reduce energy costs by not having the fans run needlessly. We wanted the system to be proactive rather than reactive. In other words, we wanted it to be able to predict when the air uh, would adversely affect the grain, I guess, rather than react to the grain not doing what we wanted to do and then turn the fans off. So we wanted it to be proactive rather than reactive. And we also wanted it to allow the estimation of the moisture content profile. And this would allow more precise control of the fans. For example, if in our bin we knew that the grain at the bottom was over dry and the grain at the top was at a safe to store or a nearly safe to store condition, we could turn the fans off when the air had capacity to dry and turn the fans on when the air had capacity to wet in an attempt to re-wet that over dry grain. And that could potentially result in nice even moisture co content profiles in the bin once the uh, drawing cycle was done. So how are we going to assess the in-grain moisture content during drying? Well, this is where the equilibrium moisture content theory comes into play. Uh, the equilibrium moisture content theory is actually really similar to the zeroth law of thermodynamics that states that a higher temperature object will transfer heat to a lower temperature object that it, that it is touching until they are both the same temperature. Same goes for moisture. A moist object is going to transfer moisture to a drier object that it is touching until they're both the same. So it, it has also been shown that the moisture content of the air within the grain voids will equilibrate with the moisture content of the grain that it is touching. Okay, so the moisture content of the air within the grain is the same as the moisture content of the grain itself. And you can measure the moisture content of the air by measuring its temperature and relative humidity and applying the appropriate equilibrium moisture content equation. So we're measuring the moisture content of the grain just by measuring the moisture content of the air within the grain. There are several different uh, versions of the equilibrium moisture content equations available in the, in the standards. The Henderson equation is the one that worked the best for us with the grains that we were working with. Um, so moisture content basically depends on relative humidity and temperature, and then there's this Kc and N in the equation as well. And Kc and Ns are simply constants that are defined for the different grains, canola, wheat, uh, barley, peas. There's a variety of grains that have these constants defined for them. So the moisture content of the air, or the moisture content of the grain essentially, depends on its temperature and relative humidity, and then these constants. So this chart is basically the chart form of that equation I just showed on the previous slide. And in this case, it has the, the, the constants for canola plugged in, and then I've plugged in a variety of temperatures and a, a variety of relative humidities to get the moisture content of the air for canola. And this, in my opinion, is um, basically the, an easier to interpret psychrometric chart that is specific for canola, okay? So what it means, or what it says basically, is that if you have air at 50% relative humidity and five degrees Celsius, if you pass that air over canola, the canola will eventually equilibrate to 8.1% moisture content. Whether the grain started at six or started at 11, it'll eventually equilibrate to 8.1. Okay, so this chart, I guess, it also illustrates the optimal weather conditions or the optimal temperature in RH to, to dry canola. If you draw a line and mark off or get rid of all of the, the moisture contents that are above 10%, that basically means that as long as you're on the left side of the line, canola is gonna dry down to dry conditions or drier. If you wanna prevent over drying, then you mark off all the moisture contents that are above or below 9%, and then there's your little path, or there's your window of optimal ambient air conditions to get canola to that optimal 9 to 10% range. Okay, but we wanted to know if we can use this information to assess in-grain moisture content. Remember, the, the moisture content of the air voids equilibrates with the moisture content of grain, and we're measuring the temperature and relative humidity of those air voids, and we wanna know if that does actually correlate to grain moisture content. To test, to see if that theory worked, we set up uh, six test bins. They were 18 inches in diameter and 10 feet tall, and those dimensions were selected so that we had the same operating static pressures as, as full-scale fans. Uh, we could collect grain samples from four different heights to do actual moisture content measurements using a Labtronics moisture meter. 
Each bin was fitted with a, p a fully perforated floor. And at the outlet, we had a temperature and RH sensor, so we could continually monitor the temperature and RH of the outlet air. And the bins were actually also suspended on a bar in a load cell, so we could continually monitor the load of the, the grain during drying. We installed a small centrifugal fan at the bottom to provide our airflow rate of one CFM per bushel. And we used a concrete mixer to artificially rewet the grain uh, to desired moisture contents before loading in the bins. In all of the bins, we were monitoring mass, the temperature and relative humidity at the inlet, the temperature and relative humidity at the outlet, the static pressure, and the fan speed. In bins three and six, we also had in-grain temperature and relative humidity at the four depths. And it was the same four depths that we were drawing samples from. And the reason we only had in-grain sensors in two of the six bins was because this setup was originally designed to determine if we could assess in-grain moisture content based on the outlet conditions alone. We were trying to eliminate any in-grain sensors, so we thought we might be able to correlate the grain moisture content profile with how the outlet conditions behaved. That theory didn't work. So we went back to using the in-grain information to assess in-grain moisture content. In summer of 2010, we initiated full-scale testing because I never believe small-scale results until I see it work at a full scale. So we had a, a 2200 bushel bin on a hopper bottom, installed it with a, a rocket aeration system. We had a three horsepower fan and we installed a sampling probe that allowed us to collect grain samples from four different heights and we were collecting from the, four, the same four heights every time. And on the sampling probe, we had our temperature and RH sensors positioned as closely as possible to our, our sampling location. So we were collecting actual samples, measuring the moisture content using a Labtronics moisture meter, and then we were assessing or measure, calculating the grain moisture content based on the temperature and relative humidity at that location. So the first question was, could we use equilibrium moisture content to assess in-grain temperature profile? And the answer was yes, actually. This, um, this graph just shows a situation where the fans have been operating after an extended wet period. I think it had rained for two or three days. Uh, so the grain was initially almost dry, but it was raining for two days and running continuously, and the grain at the bottom re-wetted. Um, and this graph shows that the temperature and relative humidity it was measuring was sensitive enough to pick up that change in moisture content. Because that green line represents the measured moisture content of the grain at the bottom, which is higher than the measured moisture content of the grain at the middle, which is higher than the measured moisture content of the grain at the top. That trend was correct with the actual measurements that we took. You can also see the, the gradual drying over the 24 hour period where this starts, because it finally stopped raining, the sun came out, and the grain actually started drying quite nicely over that 24 hour period. The second question was, do we have to turn the fans off in order to get an accurate equilibrium moisture content reading? Because the theory is that you, you have to wait for the grain to equilibrate with the air. Um, in this case, the answer was, was no. These fans were also uh, programmed to turn off for 30 minutes four times a day. And 30 minutes was previously shown to be long enough for the air to fully equilibrate with the grain. Or I shouldn't say fully. To equilibrate to 99% of the actual moisture content. And again, you probably can't see it because my pointer is a little bit too small, but there's little bumps. There's four bumps along the, the graph along the way, and that represents where the fan was turned off. And there's a little divot where, where it deviated, and then it goes back up again when the fan turns back on again. Those little divots represent a change in moisture content of less than 0.2%. So it was determined that you do not have to turn the fans off in order to get an accurate equilibrium moisture content reading because it's going to affect the results very, very little. Okay, the issue was that the, the, the calculated grain moisture contents were off from the actual moisture contents by about one or 2%. Okay, the trend was correct. It recognized that the grain at the bottom re-wetted. It was wetter than the middle, the middle or the top. But the, uh, the measured moisture content for the top, I think, was about 14%, and it was actually 16.7. The measured for the middle was, I don't know, about 13.5. It was actually 14.7 and so on. It was always off by a little bit. The trend was correct, but the magnitude was off. So we had to adjust or develop an adjustment for that. So this is an example of one of the regression equations we developed. Um, with the actual grain moisture content being on the vertical and uh, the calculated grain moisture content being on the horizontal, that black line represents the ideal one-to-one. -one. If it was in a perfect world, they would all fall in that black line. 
So the actual moisture content was always higher than the measured moisture content, always higher. And this, this makes sense because um, when you're dealing with equilibration, it takes forever for it to reach full equilibration. But it'll reach like 90 or 95% of equilibration fairly quickly within that 30 minutes. Um, so we were, when we're assuming that the, the air voids or the moisture content of the air voids is equilibrated with the grain, it's always not going to be quite the grain because it's never going to quite equilibrate. Um, so the fact that the actual was always a little bit higher than the, than the measured, I guess, agreed with that theory. So we developed a regression equation to adjust for that. And once the regression equation was applied to the original equilibrium moisture content equation, our calculated grain moisture contents were always within 1% of the actuals. We were only able to develop the regression or the adjustment equation for wheat, however. We haven't been able to uh, um, develop an adjustment equation for canola or any other grain yet but we were quite happy with how it performed for wheat. Um, one caveat I should probably add in there is that it performed well for wheat if the actual grain moisture content was between 13% and 16.5 or 17%. Below 13%, we didn't have any reliable data to throw in the regression equation, but just some, some more testing of some really dry wheat would help um, our, our regression equation, I guess, account for those low moisture contents. So it's within 1% if the grain is between 13 and 17%. Okay, I wanna go back to this chart, and in, in this case, this is the equilibrium moisture content for, for wheat. Um, remember, at 50% relative humidity and five degrees Celsius, the equilibrium moisture content of air for canola was, what, 8.1%? The same air conditions, 50% and five degrees, result in an equilibrium moisture content of 13.1% for wheat. So the ability of grain to take up moisture is different for every grain. Um, the oil content in canola just takes up less moisture than the starch and fiber in wheat. So the equilibrium moisture content of air for the different grains varies. So you have to be careful that you're looking at the right chart. Okay, so we're able to use that information to assess in grain moisture content. Now we want to use this information to determine if we can predict when we should be turning the fans on and off. Okay, let's say our, our wheat starts at 15% moisture content, or the, the wheat is at 15% moisture content. If your ambient air was at 75% relative humidity and 15 degrees, this chart says that the equilibrium moisture content is 16.1. So if your wheat is at 15 and you're passing this air that's 75% relative humidity and 15 degrees through it, that grain is probably gonna re-wet or it's going to want to approach 16.1. So maybe not turn the fans on. If that same temperature of air has a relative humidity of 55%, the equilibrium moisture content is 13.1. So if your wheat is at 15, and you're running that air through it, it's gonna to want to reach 13.1. <clears throat> so using that information and the experience gained in all of our small scale testing, we developed a uh, preliminary algorithm for control strategy to automatically turn the fans on and off. And this is it's actually fairly, fairly simple, simplistic. But it requires the measurement of three in-grain moisture contents and the moisture content of the air at the inlet. And what it does is it looks at the three grain moisture contents, and if the maximum grain moisture content is greater than 17%, and these set points are obviously set for wheat, okay, and wheat is dry at 14.5, but if the maximum wheat moisture content was greater than 17, automatically leave the fan on. No matter what the ambient conditions are, just leave the fan on. If the maximum moisture content was between 15 and 17, and the ambient air was considered dry or neutral, which again is just variable on all the different set points that we had set in there, um, then turn the fan on. If the maximum moisture content was between 14 and 15 and the ambient air was considered dry, then turn the fan on. If the maximum moisture content was be between 13 and 14, leave the fan off. Um, there's no danger of any spoilage with, with wheat that is stored less than 14%. Then we also have a, a, a wetting cycle in there where if the minimum moisture content of the grain is less than, in this case, 13%, and the ambient air is wet, or if the ambient air has capacity to wet, then turn the fan on in an attempt to re-wet that over dry grain. So this was all um, an automatic system where we had a controller that was programmed to run this algorithm. It would take 30 minute averages of all the different moisture contents and then run this decision routine. And there we had relays to turn the fans on and off. So the system was operated on a full-scale bin and the fan was automatically switching on and off every day. 
So we were unfortunately only able to run one full-scale test because we finally had this system established this past fall. And of course, we're wanting to try to run drying tests during the driest harvest in 15 years in the area. We had a really tough time finding 2,000 bushels of tough grain. Uh, but we were finally able to find, the elevator was able to, to loan us 2,000 bushels of, of wheat that came in at about 16%. It was loaded on September 15th, and within 12 days, the grain was average dry. But the fan was only running 45% of the time. Now, the most logical way to assess whether running this strategy is better than just running the fan continuously is to run side-by-side -side trials. Have the exact same bins with the exact same grain, one running continuously and one running with a strategy. A moisture content of the grain at the bottom of the bin as it was affected by the on-off cycle of the fan. Um, so when the fan is on, there's actually quite rapid drying. And when the fan is off, it looks like it's re-wetting. There's a little bit of a, a jump or a bump back in. But this was probably just um, the moisture migration within the kernel. The kernel's dry from the outside, outside in, obviously, so when the fan turns off, the moisture that's still left inside the kernel is going to migrate to the outside of the kernel, and it's going to result in what looks like re-wetting, but it's just moisture equilibri equilibration within the kernel. So in this case, you can see that the moisture kernel of the grain drops fairly uh, evenly in, s in straight steps down with this control strategy. When you're looking at moisture content of grain when you're running continuously, it follows the diurnal pattern of the ambient air, where you might dry two steps, re-wet one and a half, dry two steps, re-wet one and a half, dry two steps, re-wet one and a half. When you're running the control strategy, you're drawing two steps and then re-wetting maybe half a step or so. Okay, this is the um, on-off cycle as dictated by the algorithm during our, our full scale, first scale run. Uh, the red squares represent when the fan was on. And that was, like I said, typically between 10 a.m. and 10 p.m. So the fan was only on 45% of the time, and that included the three days at the end where it ran pretty well continuously trying to re-wet that green at the bottom. <clears throat> so what would be the benefit of a control strategy like this? Well, let's say you're running a five horsepower fan and you're running it almost continuously for 30 days. Okay, the ambient weather isn't, isn't cooperating, so it takes almost a month to get some grain down. Uh, that's going to require about 3,000 kilowatt hours of electricity. And if you're paying 10 cents a kilowatt hour, it's going to result in $300 per month per fan. If you can optimize the operating cycle, and this is based on our preliminary results only, but it's saying that you run the fans for the same length of time, but you only have to operate it 45 or 50 percent of the time, then you can cut down your power consumption by half. And that's $150 per bin per month. So if you're running 10 fans in your yard, that can add up quite a bit. Also, a control strategy like this will reduce the chance of grain spoilage or overdrying and reduce the labor. If, you are, if you're drying to the point where it's uh, average dry, like it's dry in the middle but still kind of tough on the top, it requires a lot of uh, grain management and labor to mix that grain and, and pour it, put it in another bin to kind of mix it up and get an even moisture content. This system is designed to result in an even moisture content profile um, automatically. Okay, I mentioned I was gonna talk about the cost of overdrying, um, and this is specific to canola, just because the price of canola is much higher than wheat, so these numbers look more impressive. But let's say a, a 2,000 bushel bin uh, comes off slightly tough, and so you throw it in the bin, you turn on, turn on your natural air drying system, and you leave it for a couple days. Next time you go back and check, it turns out that the overall average moisture content is 8%. Whoa, okay, it's dry, I'll turn it off and, and let it sit. It's fine, it'll, it'll store good. And yeah, you're right, but you've now lost the amount of water in there that is still saleable. 10% is allowable. Um, you've dropped it down to 8%, and the difference in mass of water between 8% and 10% is just over one ton. If canola is selling at $567 a ton, which it was when I made this slide, uh, this represents just over $600 of lost revenue, and that's a single 2,000 bushel bin, which is pretty small. Plus the cost of running your fan, needlessly or unnecessarily. Overdrying is actually about as costly, if not more costly, than selling tough grain. And I talked to a few farmers in the office before I came, and I swear they would rather chew off their left leg than pay the elevator fees for drawing their grain. I don't know, I don't know why, but um, if you take in 2,000 bushels at 12%, which is 2% over um, safe to store, I guess, then you're going to be paying 504 in penalties. Whereas if you overdraw it by 2%, you're losing $600 in revenue. <coughs> 
So overdrawing is, is more costly than, than underdrawing. But let's say a, a 2,000 bushel bin uh, comes off slightly tough. And so you throw it in the bin, you turn on, turn on your natural drawing system, and you leave it for a couple days. Next time you go back and check, it turns out that the overall average moisture content is 8%. Whoa, okay, it's dry, I'll turn it off and, and let it sit. It's fine, it'll, it'll store good. And yeah, you're right, but you've now lost the amount of water in there that is still saleable. 10% is allowable. Um, you've dropped it down to 8%, and the difference in mass of water between 8% and 10% is just over one ton. If canola is selling at $567 a ton, which it was when I made this slide, uh, this represents just over $600 of lost revenue, and that's a single 2,000 bushel bin, which is pretty small. Plus the cost of running your fan, needlessly or unnecessarily. Overdrawing is actually about as costly, if not more costly, than selling tough grain. And I talked to a few farmers in the office before I came, and I swear they would rather chew off their left leg than pay the elevator fees for drawing their grain. I don't know, I don't know why, but um, if you take in 2,000 bushels at 12%, which is 2% over um, safe to store, I guess, then you're going to be paying 504 in penalties. Whereas if you overdraw it by 2%, you're losing $600 in revenue. So overdrawing is, is more costly than, than underdrawing. I also want to talk about the value of rewetting, and this was actually a pretty hot topic last year when I was again I was talking to the farmers in the office about this project and, and the ability to rewet grain, because like I said, we had the driest harvest in 15 years, and we had a lot of canola coming off um, that couldn't even be measured; it was so dry. They were guessing it was three or four percent moisture content. It was so dry, it could not be measured by the Labtronics moisture meter. So one of the farmers that sits ne next to me, he asked, like, "So can I rewet my grain?" I'm like, "Theoretically, yeah, you can." I said, "Run the fans at night." and uh, see how it goes. So he did that, and I think he had a 2,500 bushel bin. He ran the fans for every night for a week, and he took the grain out and mixed it and got an average moisture content, he said, of just under 7%. So he was able to go from 3 or 4% to 7% in a week. And the value of that is quite a bit. Let's say you take off your, mo your, your canola at 6% only, and let's just assume, assume 1,000 bushels. If you're able to rewet that grain from 6% to 7%, the added revenue is $964 per thousand bushels. <clears throat> if you're able to rewet from 6% to 10%, which is saleable, that's an added revenue of $1,474 per thousand bushels. So the value of rewetting is uh, quite significant. That's when canola is being sold at 567 a ton. I don't know if that's typical or average or if that's even true in, in Manitoba, but that's what it was in Saskatchewan apparently last week. Okay, how feasible is a system like this to implement? Um, our system requires at least four temperature and RH sensors, three in grain and one at the inlet, and then relay, relays to switch the fan on and off. Um, traditionally, measuring relative humidity in grain is pretty costly and not very uh, reliable, but Technology has advanced, and the sensors that we used were really cheap. They were 50 bucks each, so that's $200 in sensors per bin, and they were really reliable. We did three years of testing with these sensors, and we only had one fail out of, I think, the 40 or so that we had. So each bin requires four temperature and RE sensors, and each bin setup, excuse me, which could operate theoretically up to 10 bins, would require a controller to execute the algorithm and some sort of interface for user input, like grain type, starting moisture content, etc. Why hasn't this been done before? It has. Okay, Opie out of Calgary has a system uh, based very similar or to the same um, theory as this, the equilibrium moisture content. Um, and they actually can control aeration, drying with and without heat, and ventilation for large bins. Their system is, if you want the full meal deal, if you want the entire control strategy, it's quite costly. And it really is designed for large bins, 100,000 bushels plus. There's also an aeration control system out of Australia, which controls drying, aeration, and conditioning in large silos. And their system, as far as I can tell, doesn't rely on any ingrain sensors, but they get their ingrain moisture assessment based on the condition of the grain going in, and then the weather conditions when the fan is operating. So they're probably doing a, a similar strategy to this one as well. In addition, there are differential controls out there for aeration systems that simply um, allow the fan to operate only when the outside temperature is colder than the grain by a few degrees. And those differential control systems are quite simple and cheap. And they have been shown to reliably uh, reduce the temperature of grain faster and to lower temperatures than manual control. <clears throat> 
Other grain drying research going on right now at PAMI, we're looking at some computational fluid dynamic uh, discrete modeling of airflow within a bin. And this is going to be useful for designing and optimizing new inlet and outlet configurations. As well, some of you may have come across this article in the Western Producer a couple weeks ago from the Indian Head Agricultural Research Farm in, Indian Head in southern Saskatchewan. They are uh, developing their own control strategy for natural air drying, and they're using a mass balance approach where they basically treat the bin as a black box and they look at the amount of moisture going in versus the amount of moisture going out. So they're not doing anything in grain. They just monitor the amount of moisture going in and the amount of moisture going out. And their theory, and it's true, is that when the amount of moisture leaving the bin is greater than the amount of moisture entering the bin, you have drying. Makes sense, right? So they ran some trials and they found that you get more moisture leaving the bin at night than during the day. And it was quite um, noticeable and it was very repetitive. Like it was every single day, more moisture was leaving at night than during the day. So they concluded and they published this article in the Western Producer saying, we've been doing it wrong all along. Turn the fans off during the day and turn it on at night and you'll get more moisture loss. Anybody come across that article? What do you guys think? <laughs> okay, I don't disagree with their results. I looked at their results and yes, they were getting more moisture loss during the evening hours than during the daytime hours. But that was based on trials that were running the fans 24-7. They ran the fans continuously and they saw more moisture loss at night than during the day. So now they're concluding that turn the fans off during the day and turn them on at night. I think what was happening is you're running the fans continuously, so you're running them during the day, so you're warming the grain up. At night, you're pulling in cool air that has little capacity to hold moisture. It hits the warm grain mass, it warms up, it now has a greater capacity to pull out air, and so it does at night. So their theory of more moisture loss at night depends on the grain being warm. If you run the fans only at night, you're not gonna have a warm grain mass, and you're not gonna see that same kind of noticeable more, more loss at night than during the day. They did run side-by-side -side trials. They did have the equipment and the ability to run side-by-side -side trials full scale in a 2,000 bushel bin. And they ran them last fall with one bin running continuously and one bin running at night only. And their results were inconclusive. They said, and, and if this is true, is because the grain wasn't very tough to begin with. Again, it was a very, very dry harvest for us last year. So they, they couldn't find tough grain either. Um, but I, I will reserve judgment <laughs> until I see um, more conclusive results on their side-by-side -side, side -side testing. <clears throat> Potential future work at PAMI. Um, there still needs to be quite a bit of work done on, the, on our control strategy. Number one is side-by-side -side full scale testing. Um, I gave this presentation at a, an agronomy update in Red Deer a couple, about two months ago, I guess. And someone came to me and said, okay, so I'm drying my malt barley incorrectly. I should be doing this and this and this. And I'm like, <laughs> You've been drawing malt barley for 20, 30 years and it's been working well. Do not change it yet, please. There's still a lot of work left to be done with this control strategy. Just, we're just illustrating, I guess, the, uh, the ability or the possibility of controlling fans using equilibrium moisture content. We're not quite there yet. So some optimization still needs to be done as well as de development and refinement of the calculations specifically for canola. Right now we can only assess ingrained moisture content for wheat. Uh, an analysis of the impact of starting and stopping the fan on the cooling and drying front needs to be done, as well as an analysis of the buffer capacity of the grain at the bottom. So a lot of work yet needs to go. Other grain storage work we'd like to get into is maybe looking at the potential for adding aeration to grain bag storage. We're all going to hear about and see grain bag storage later on today. Uh, it's possible that we can extend, like right now these are really only supposed to be only useful for three to six months storage. It's possible we can extend that by adding some simple aeration systems in there. As well, we'd, we'd like to look at some natural ventilation systems. And I'm not sure how common these are in Manitoba, but they're cropping up all over in Saskatchewan, where they're fanless uh, natural air drying systems, where you simply place a perforated tube down the center of the bin, and that enhances the natural convection that happens in the bin. And it supposedly results in much faster drying with no fan whatsoever. Um, again, those results or those um, successes are only based on farmer testimonials. And I've heard just as many testimonials that say that these things turn their bins into chia pets. So there needs to be some validation work done on these uh, natural ventilation systems as well. <clears throat> so in summary, I think I've gone well over my hour, sorry. 
Uh, aeration is cooling and it uses a lower airflow. Natural air drying is drying and it uses a high airflow, 10 times higher than aeration. You have to measure static pressure in order to gauge airflow. Grain storage requires good management and canola storage requires extra good management. Currently, natural air drying systems require a lot of guesswork uh, to, or to guess, I guess, the ingrain moisture content and the air's capacity to dry. But you can actually assess ingrain moisture content based on ingrain temperature and RH. And we developed a control strategy that was based on equilibrium moisture content. And the full scale run suggested that fans should only be operating 45% of the time for approximately the same length of time. But more development and refinement is required and existing products are not feasible for smaller producers. I had tons of sources of information in addition to these, and I want to thank everyone back at PAMI that put up with my rambling and many, many questions over the last couple weeks.